I want to invite you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. And as you know, we're in a series right now called Going Deeper. It has to do with the resolution series or sermon that I did on January 3rd to start the new year. The Lord, I think, impressed us as a church to have some things that we want to be about in 2016, at least spiritually. And so I talked about spending more time doing one thing and less time doing another. The first week we looked at what it meant to spend more time drawing closer to God and less time really doing all the other things, not bad things, but other things. We want to at least exchange some of that time in 2016 and spend more time drawing nearer to God. Last week we looked at what it meant to spend more time giving thanks and less time in 2016 doing what some of us are so good at doing, really all of us, which is worrying, right? How many want to do that less this year and give thanks to God more? Well, we looked at that last Sunday. Today, what I want to look at is what it means in 2016 for us as believers in Jesus Christ to spend more time being godly and less time, to use a Christian term, being worldly. Really, if you break down that statement, even more, I'd like to say we want to spend more time living godly lives and less time living worldly lives. How many of you think that sounds like a good goal for followers of Jesus Christ in 2016? I think it's something that even the Bible tells us that we want to be about. So with Bibles in hand, 2 Peter 3, read this with me. Peter writes, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, and we know that we're in the last days, in fact, Jesus said these were the last days 2,000 years ago. In the last days, scoffers, mockers really, will come. They're going to be scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming that he promised? That would be his second coming, right? They say, ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed, and Jesus hasn't come back. But Peter says they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed. And the earth was formed out of water and by water. And by these waters also, the world of that time was, as we know in the flood, deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. God promised he would never destroy the world again by a flood, right? And as that promise, he gave us the rainbow to remind us, I'll never destroy the world again by a flood. But the Bible makes it clear in Revelation, and even here, that the way that God is going to judge the world is going to be this time, not by water, but by fire. He says, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of what kind of men? It's important for today's sermon. The destruction of ungodly men. He says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And if you're waiting for God on something, sometimes it feels like that, right? You're like, Lord, when? And you remember, oh yeah, a day for him is like a thousand. That's just, oh dear. But here's the truth. The Lord, Peter says, is not slow in keeping his promise. At least as far as slowness is concerned, or as far as people understand slowness, he, God, is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, right? Folks, the Lord's will is that none should perish. And so Peter tells us specifically here, the reason why God is holding off the return of Jesus Christ is so that more people might come to know him. How many of you have family and friends here this morning that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and you're praying for them, right? You're seeking the Lord for them. All of us do. And Peter tells us his grace is holding off his return so that more people might come to know him, but... Peter goes on, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. In other words, don't live your lives thinking he'll never return. It will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth, and everything in it will be laid bare. Now, since everything will be destroyed in this way, Peter writes, what kind of people ought you, followers of Jesus Christ, what kind of people ought we to be? 
He says you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day, he says, will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. The home of righteousness. How many of us are looking forward to a brand new heaven where there's no more sin, no more sickness, no more disease? That's what the Bible says is coming for us. And in fact, folks, he says, so then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, this new heaven and new earth, this home of righteousness, he says, make every effort to be found spotless, to be found blameless, and to be found at peace with God. Now that sounds like a very good challenge. Is everybody crystal clear on how we accomplish that? How we're found spotless and blameless? I think it's pretty clear. So why don't we close in a word of prayer, right? Well, I want to pray actually and God, ask God to give us some clarity this morning. Father, we are thankful that your word speaks loud and clear. We're thankful that you gave it to us. And by the power of your spirit, it reveals who we are. It reveals your plans for us. It reveals how it is that somebody comes to know you as their Lord and Savior. So we ask that you would guide our time in your word this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right. I want to look at this. I find that as a pastor, there's oftentimes confusion around some very common Christian terms that we like to throw around as pastors and even as believers. Terms like godliness. Terms like holiness. Terms like worldliness. And all of these ideas about what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, not always do people fully grasp what those terms really mean. In fact, as a pastor, my, one of my biggest goals is to preach the Word of God practically. I don't want to preach it so that it goes over everybody's head. I want to put, as they like to say, the cookies on the bottom shelf. I want it to be something that we walk away from and we can say, oh, I see how that applies to my life. And when it comes to this challenge, the one that I said today, that we want to spend more time in 2016 living godly lives and less time in 2016 living worldly lives, I think it's helpful to carefully define those terms. Because if we want to hit the mark of that goal, then we have to know what we're aiming for, don't we? There's nothing more frustrating than challenging or being challenged and not knowing what you're supposed to do. And so, practically speaking, go back to 2 Peter 3. Let's clear up the terms, first of all, spotless and blameless. I'll read the verse again. Peter ends that section saying, So then, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, the return of Jesus and a new heaven and a new earth, he says, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So the question I ask as I'm reading this is how am I found spotless? How am I found blameless? And how is anybody found at peace with God? And folks, there is as much confusion about that as there is anything. You know, as a pastor for more than 20 years, I hear people say that in order to go to heaven, I have to live a good life. In order to go to heaven, I have to be a good person. And when I'm challenged to be spotless and blameless, Oftentimes, people hear that as sinless. I'm supposed to not sin as a Christian. But if you know the bumper sticker, and I'm sure we've all seen it, Christians aren't perfect, we're just forgiven, right? So the truth is, there's nothing perfect about us or sinless about us. The only way anyone is found spotless and blameless the only way that anybody is going to have peace with God in heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you stop and you say, oh, pastor, there's another term that's so often misunderstood. The blood of Jesus Christ. Is that what this tank is full of? Is that what you're going to do is cover people in blood? Folks, it's a term meaning when Jesus Christ died on the cross, his blood was shed. His body was broken and his blood was shed for the forgiveness of the sins of mankind. And when a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ, the term covered in the blood or covered by the blood means because of your acceptance of what Jesus did for you on the cross, you are forgiven. And because of that, you're holy, 
and you're blameless in God's sight. One of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 1, says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul writes, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be, there it is, holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Now hear this. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his, what does it say? Through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. What that means is, folks, when it comes to being forgiven or being saved, you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't, I can't be good enough. The only way we're found spotless and blameless and forgiven is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's it. That's all. And who says amen to that? It's by what Jesus did for us, not what we do for him. Folks, he, Jesus, alone can forgive, and he alone can save. And I want you to remember that as a Christian here this morning. And I want that to sink in and let that set you free from works-based religion. Feeling like if you sin, you're not good enough. Feeling like if you make mistakes, that God is angry with you. You're covered in the blood, and God sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ. And according to Ephesians 1.4, he sees us as holy and blameless in his sight. That is good news, and that is the truth. So I want to define spotless, blameless, and how we have peace with God only through Jesus Christ. But let's get to what it means to be godly then, and what it means not to be worldly. What does that mean? Now, this is going to be a two-parter, partially because we're going to baptize people today. Today, I want to look at what it means to not be worldly as believers in Jesus Christ. Next week, we'll look at what it means to live godly lives. But half of that equation is not being worldly. And so what does that look like? And right off the top, as Christians, when we start talking about being worldly or the world, do you ever hear people talk about the world and kind of see them in negative connotation or negative terms, a pejorative idea, you know, the world, a bunch of pagans. Oh, they're all heathens. The world is sinners. And oftentimes Christians look down their noses at the world, mankind, and we kind of present a God who's angry at the world. But folks, don't forget what God said in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. You see, God doesn't want to see this world go to hell in a handbasket. God sent his son to save this world, because God loves his creation. And so we, we need to remember right off the top, God doesn't hate this ungodly world. And he doesn't want to send everybody to hell. That's why Jesus came to die for ungodly sinners. You realize that. Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul writes, You see, at just the right time, when we, mankind, were still without power, powerless, Christ died for the who? You see, Jesus didn't die for religious people. Jesus didn't die for people who are perfect. There would be no one that Jesus died for. Jesus died for people just like you and just like me. People who struggle with sin. People who make mistakes. People whose lives aren't perfect. That's all of us, right? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the truth is, because of that, we who were also ungodly, just like the rest of the world, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says we move from being ungodly to being godly. Our lives are changed. You were ungodly before, but now because of Jesus Christ and his shed blood and your acceptance of that, the Bible says you now are godly. But the reality is not everybody accepts Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, do they? Not everybody believes in Jesus. Not everybody 
trust Jesus for salvation and life, the truth is many people reject Jesus. And they reject him and deny altogether that he even existed. Some people choose to live as they please. They choose to remain unforgiven. They choose to remain, and they don't use the term, but they choose to remain ungodly. You see, a lot of the world continues to do whatever feels best for them. And they say, I answer to nobody, right? You know anybody like that? When you start talking about Jesus, the Lord of your life, they don't even understand what you're saying. No one's the Lord of my life, some say. I do what I want, and I do what's best for me. The Bible calls that kind of person somebody who is walking in the flesh. Somebody who pleases their sinful nature. And folks, again, we all have a sinful nature. We all, prior to Jesus Christ, we do whatever we want and whatever feels best to us, right? I was 20 years old when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I remember quite well who I wanted to please with my life. And it wasn't God, it was me. I wanted to do what was best for me. And I didn't care about anybody else for the most part in life. But as soon as somebody puts their faith in Jesus Christ, all of that changes, doesn't it? Now, the Bible makes clear what the works of the flesh or the sinful nature is. The Apostle Paul, he lays it out crystal clear. If you've got Bibles, Galatians 5, it'll be on the screen. Here's what it looks like to live like the world, to live like the ungodly. Paul says in verse 19, the acts of of the sinful nature. They're obvious, he says. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage. This is the sinful nature in all of us, men and women. Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Paul says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this. Another version say those who practice this kind of lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of God. Even to make it more clear, Paul goes on in 2 Timothy 3. He says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People, here's what the world looks like. Here's what the sinful nature look, what looks like. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful. Proud. Abusive disobedient to their parents, which really boil that down, it just means they disdain authority, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Folks, those lists is how people who don't know God and care about God live. That, if you boil it down, that is the world. That's what the sinful nature looks like, mind you, the world that Jesus died for, right? Because you look at those lists. Look at jealousy. Well, I've been jealous before. You look at envy. Well, I'm on that list. I've been envious before. You look at hatred. I've sometimes in my heart over the years, selfish ambition. You look at those things and you think, well, I'm guilty of some of those things. Not all of those things, thank goodness. But some of those things, I'm guilty of those. Remember, we're not perfect. We're forgiven, right? We, just like the world, have a sinful nature. But when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we no longer have to live by that sinful nature. In fact, now we want to live by the power of the Holy Spirit and we want to look different than this, right? Before I was a Christian, I didn't care whether or not my life looked like this. In fact, sometimes I was bragging to people about, oh, I went and did this and went and did that. You know, reveling in my sinfulness. When a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ and is filled with the Holy Spirit, suddenly what? We have conviction and we want to live differently. Not because we have to, but because we want to. All of it changes when a person puts their faith in Jesus. We no longer have to live like this. We can say no to our sinful nature. And we can say no to how the world lives. And now we can live godly lives. In fact, lives that are entirely different because of Jesus Christ. I want you to realize the Lord draws a clear distinction between himself and the world. 
even between his followers, his disciples, us, and the world. John 15, just before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed this for his followers. He said in verse 18, speaking of his followers, even us today, if the world hates you, keep in mind, Jesus says, that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. He says, that is why the world doesn't like you or hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they, the world, who doesn't care about God, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also, as long as you continue to preach what I preach, right? And we continue in 2016, 2,000 plus years later, we continue to preach the word of God, amen? We're not off on some tangent preaching other things. We preach what Jesus said. It's called the good news. It's called the gospel. And so if we continue to preach what Jesus did, they'll obey us. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they don't know the one, they don't know God who sent me. And I've said it many times as I preach over the years, that if you want to go out in today's culture and you want to talk about spirituality, if you want to talk about God, if you want to talk about Mother Nature, or whatever kind of term you want to use, nobody's really going to get that upset. Spirituality is, is a cool thing today for a lot of people. Go to Boulder, it's even cooler up there, right? You know, oh, let's talk about spiritual things and all that. But as soon as you mention Jesus Christ, it's like the gloves come off, the sleeves come up, and people are ready to go to battle, right? Right? Jesus Christ, and that's where it is that the hair on the back of people's necks, they begin to stand up and people get angry. God, fine, the name of Jesus Christ is where people, they draw a dividing line. That's where people, ah, oh, you're one of those Christians, right? And folks, the truth is, we don't, as followers of Jesus Christ, belong to this world anymore. This is not our home. And who can say thank God to that? We have a future home. We have a place that is going to be no more sorrow, no more sin. Listen, the power of sin because of Jesus Christ has been broken. Do you realize the penalty for sin, which the Bible says is death, that penalty has been paid. But the reality is the presence, it's three Ps, I like that. The presence of sin is still with us until we go to that home of righteousness, like the Bible says, until the new heaven and the new earth. The power of sin has been broken. The penalty for sin has been paid. But we still live in this stuff called the flesh. And the presence of sin still exists on this earth. And so when it comes to us as followers of Jesus Christ, now we can say no to that sinful nature. And we're no longer slaves to sin. Now we are slaves to righteousness. I love it. So when we say we want to spend more time being godly and less time being worldly, we mean we want to no longer live like the world who doesn't know God. We, we mean we, we want to live no longer like the world who doesn't believe in God. We don't want to continue living like the world who doesn't care about God. Instead, we want to spend more time living godly lives because we know God. Because we believe in God and because we love God and care about God. Amen? That's why it is that we don't want to live like those lists anymore. Are you ever going to struggle? Yes. Are you ever going to fail? Yes. Are you ever going to make mistakes? We all do, but we are forgiven because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We are no longer ungodly. We are godly because of Jesus Christ. And folks, that is good news. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... That person is a new creation. The old has passed away. Read that, the old sinful nature that used to rule and reign in your life. It's gone. And behold, Paul writes, all things, your life now has become what? Brand new. It's new because of Jesus Christ. You're now a new creation in Christ because of him. So that's what it looks to spend less time living like the world, living like all of those who don't care about God, 
But what does it mean to spend more time living a godly life? As I said, next week we're going to really dive into that. There's a whole bunch of good things that the Bible has to say about godliness. And I want to clear up some misunderstandings about righteousness and holiness and godliness. It may not be everything that you think it is. But today, as we close the service, the cool thing is, one of the things that it means to be godly means that we obey the Lord's commands. The Bible says, if you love me, Jesus did, you will obey my commands. And one of the commands that Jesus gave was to be baptized. And so we've got, I think, five or six people today that are going to be baptized. And before they come up, I'm going to invite the band to come up because they're going to sing a song that is really cool about what it means to be a new creation in Christ.